All right. Hello, everyone. Um, today I'm going to talk about uh, this paper about how Facebook uses memcache um, in order to handle enormous load. Um, the reason we're reading this paper is that <clears throat> it's an experience paper. So there's not really any new concepts or ideas or techniques here, but it's um, kind of what a real live um, company ran into when they were uh, trying to build very um, high capacity infrastructure. There's a couple of ways you could read it. Um, one is a, a sort of cautionary tale about um, what goes wrong if you don't take consistency seriously from the start. Um, another way to read it is that it's an impressive story about how to get extremely high um, capacity from using mostly off-the-shelf software. Um, Another way to read it is that it's a kind of illustration or of the fundamental struggle that um, a lot of setups face between trying to get very high performance, um, which you do by things like replication and how to get consistency for which uh, techniques like replication are really the enemy. Um, and so, you know, we can argue about whether we like their design or we think it's elegant or a good solution, um, but we can't really argue with how successful they've been. Um, so we, we do need to take them seriously. Um, and for me, actually, this paper, uh, which I first read quite a few years ago, it, it's been, um, I thought about it a lot, and it's been sort of a source of, um, a source of ideas and understanding about problems um, at many points. All right, so... Um, before talking about Facebook proper, you know, they're an example of a pattern that you see fairly often or that many people have experienced in which they're trying to build a website to do something. And, you know, typically people who build websites are not interested in building high performance, um, you know, high performance storage infrastructure. They're interested in building features that will make their users happy or selling more advertisements or something. Um, and, you know, so they, they're not going to start by spending a man year of effort or a whole lot of time building cool infrastructure. They're going to start by building features and that they'll sort of make infrastructure better only to the extent that they really have to, because, you know, that's the best use of their time. All right. So um, a typical starting scenario um, when a waste, when a, some website is very small is, you know, there's no point in starting with anything more than just a single machine. Right, you know, maybe you start, you only have a couple users um, sitting in front of their browsers and, you know, they talk over the internet to your, to your single machine and your single machine is going to maybe run the um, Apache uh, web server. You know, maybe you write the uh, scripts that produce web pages um, using PHP or Python or some other convenient um, easy to program sort of scripting style language and Facebook uses PHP. Um, you need to store your data somewhere. Boy, you can just download a sort of standard database um, uh, and Facebook happened to use MySQL. MySQL is a good choice because it, it implements the SQL query language is very powerful and ACID transactions provides durable storage. So this is like a very, um, a very nice setup. And we'll take you a long way, actually. But supposing, um, supposing you get successful, you get more and more users, you know, you're going to get more and more load, more and more people are going to be uh, viewing your website and running whatever PHP stuff your website uh, provides. Um, and so at some point, almost certainly, the first thing that's going to go wrong is that the PHP scripts are going to take up too much CPU time. That's usually the... Um, first bottleneck people encounter if they start with a single server. So what you need is some way to get more horsepower for your PHP scripts. And so that takes us to kind of architecture number two for websites, um, in which you know, now you have lots and lots of users, right? Um, or more users than before. You need more CPU power for your PHP scripts. So you run a bunch of front end servers um, whose only job is to run the web servers that users' browsers talk to. And so these are usually called front-end servers. So these are going to run Apache, the 
uh, web server and the PHP scripts. Now, you know, your users are going to talk to different servers at different times. Maybe your users cooperate with each other, they message with each other, they need to see each other's posts or something. So all these front end servers are going to need to see the same back end data. Um, And uh, in order to do that, you probably can just stick, at least for a while, you can just stick with one database server. So you can have a single machine um, running MySQL that handles all of the database, all queries and updates, reads and writes from the front end servers. Um, and if you possibly can, it's wise to use a single server here because as soon as you go with two servers and somehow split your data up over multiple database servers, life gets much more complicated. Um, and you need to worry about things like, do you need distributed transactions or how does the PHP script decide which database server to talk to? And so again, you can get a long way with this second architecture. You have a, as much CPU power as you like by adding more front end servers um, and up to a point, um, a single database server will actually be able to absorb the reads and writes of many front ends. But you know, maybe you're very successful. Um, you get even more users. And um, so the question is, what's going to go wrong next? And typically what goes wrong next is that the uh, database server, since you can always add more CPU, more web servers, um, you know, what inevitably goes wrong is that after a while, the um, database server runs out of steam. Um, OK, so what's the next architecture? Um, so this is web architecture three and the kind of standard evolution of big websites. Um, here we have the same, we have you know, now you know, thousands and thousands of users, um, lots and lots of front ends. And now we basically, we know we're gonna have to uh, have multiple uh, database servers. So now behind the front ends, we have a whole rack of uh, database servers, um, each one of them running MySQL again, uh, but we're going to shard the data. Um, we're driven now to sharding the data over the um, database server. So, you know, maybe the first one holds keys, you know, A through G and G through, uh, second one holds keys G through Q and, you know, whatever the sharding happens to be. And now the front end, you know, you have to teach your PHP scripts here to look at the data they need and try to figure out which database server they're going to talk to. And, you know, at different times for different data, they're going to talk to different servers. So this is sharding. Um, and of course, the reason why this gives you a, a boost is that now um, the, all the work of reading and writing is split up, hopefully, hopefully evenly it, uh, split up between these servers um, since they hold different data. They're not replicas, right? We're sharding the data um, and they can execute in parallel and have big parallel capacity to read and write data. Um, it's a little bit painful. The PHP code has to know about the sharding. Um, if you change the setup of the database servers, like you add a new database server, or you realize you need to split up the keys differently, you know, now you need, uh, you're going to have to modify the software running in the front ends or something in order for them to understand about how to cut over to the new sharding. So there's some, there's some pain here. There's also, uh, if you need transactions and, you know, many people use them, if you need transactions, but the the data involved in a single transaction is on more than one database server. Uh, you're probably going to need two-phase commit or some other distributed transaction scheme. Um, and it's also a pain and slow. <clears throat> All right. Well, you can um, you can get fairly far with this arrangement. Um, however, it's quite expensive. MySQL um, or sort of you know fully featured database servers like people like to use. It's not particularly fast. Um, it can um, probably only perform a couple hundred thousand reads per second and far fewer writes. Uh, and you know, web sites tend to be um, read heavy, so it's likely that you're going to run out of steam for reads um, before writes. That the uh, traffic will be the load on the web servers will be dominated by reads. And so after a while, you know, you can slice the data more and more thinly over more and more uh, servers. But two things go wrong with that. One is that the, um, some, sometimes you're, you have specific keys that are hot, that are used a lot, and no amount of slicing really helps there because each key is only on a single server. Um, 
So if that key is very popular, that server is going to be overloaded no matter how much you partition or shard the data. Um, and the other problem with adding, with sharding, uh, adding lots and lots of MySQL database servers for sharding um, is that uh, it's really an expensive way to go, as it turns out. And after a point, you're going to you're going to start to think that, well, instead of spending a lot of money to add another uh, database server running MySQL, I could take the same server, um, run something much faster on it, like as it happens, memcached, and get a lot more reads per second out of the same hardware using caching than using databases. So uh, the next architecture, um, and this is now starting to resemble what Facebook is using. Um, the next architecture, still need users. Um, we still have a bunch of front end servers running web servers and PHP. You know, by now maybe a vast number of front end servers. We still have our database servers because you know we need a, a system that. Um, will store data safely on disk for us and will provide things like transactions for us. Um, and so, you know, probably want a database for that. But in between, we're gonna have a caching layer. And so this is where memcached comes in. Um, and you know, of course, there's other things you could use other than memcached, but memcached happens to be an extremely popular caching scheme. And the idea now is you have a whole bunch of uh, these memcached servers and when a front end needs to read some data, um, the first thing it does is ask one of the memcached servers, look, do you have the data I need? So it'll send a get request with some key to one of the memcached servers. Um, and the memcached server will check. It's got just a table in memory. It's, it's, in fact, memcached is extremely simple. It's far, far simpler than your um, lab three for example, uh, it just has it just has a big hash table in memory. It checks whether that key's in the hash table. If it is, it sends back the data saying, "Oh yeah, here's the value I've cached for that." Um, and if we if the front end hits in this memcached server, great, it can then produce the web page with that data in it. If it misses in the web server, though, the front end has to um, then re-request the data from the relevant database server, um, and the database server will say, "Oh, you know, here's the here's the data you need." And um, at that point, um, in order to cache it for the next front end that needs it, uh, the front end will um, send a put with the data it fetched from the database into that uh, memcache server. And because memcache runs at least 10 and maybe, maybe more than 10 times faster for reads than the database, um, for a given amount of hardware, it really pays off to use a fair amount, some of that hardware for memcache as well as um, for the database servers. So people. Uh, people use this arrangement a lot and it just saves them money um, because memcache is so much faster for reads than a database server. Still need to send writes to the database because you want writes, you want updates to be um, uh, stored durably on the database's disk and to still be there if there's a crash or something. Um, uh, but you can send the reads to the cache very much quick, more quickly. Okay, so, so we have a question. The question is, why wouldn't the memcache server execute the put on behalf of the front end and cache the response before responding to the front end? So that's a great question. Um, you could imagine a caching layer that um, you would send a get to it, and it would, if it missed, the memcache layer would, would forward the uh, request to the database. The database would spawn the memcache. Memcache would add the data to its uh, tables and then respond. And the reason for this is that um, Memcache is like a completely separate piece of software that doesn't know anything about databases and is actually not even necessarily used in, con in conjunction with the database, um, although it often is. Um, so we can't bake in knowledge of a database into Memcache. And a, a sort of deeper reason is that the front ends are often not really storing one for one database records in Memcache. Almost always or very frequently what's going on is that the front end will issue some requests to the database and then process the results somewhat. You know, maybe take a few steps to turning it into um, HTML or sort of collect together, um, you know, results from multiple um, queries on multiple rows in the database and cached partially processed information in memcache just to save the next reader from having to do the same processing. Um, and for that reason, Memcache 
it doesn't really does not understand the relationship between what the front ends would like to see see cached and how to derive that data from the database. That knowledge is really only in the PHP code on the front end. So therefore, even though it could be architecturally a good idea, we can't have this integration here, um, sort of direct contact between memcache and the database, although it might make the cache consistency story much more straightforward. And yes, this is, it's this, um, an answer to the next question that uh, is the difference between a look aside cache and a look through cache. Um, the fact, the look aside business is that uh, the front end sort of looks aside to the cache to see if it, the data is there. And if it's not, it makes its own arrangements for getting the data on the miss. You know, a, a look through cache might forward the request to the database and directly and handle the response. Um, and you know, part of the reason for the popularity in memcache is that it is, it is a look aside cache that is completely neutral about whether there's a database or what's in the database or the relationship between stuff in memcache and what's in the and, uh, items in the database. All right. Um, so this is a very popular arrangement, very widely used. Um, it's cost effective because memcache is so much faster than the database. Um, it's a bit complex. Um, every website that makes serious use of this faces the problem that um, if you don't do something, the data that's stored in the caches will get out of sync with the data in the database. Um, and so everybody has to have a story for um, how to make sure that when you modify something in the database, you um, do something to memcache to you know, take care of the fact that memcache may then be storing stale data that doesn't reflect the updates. And a lot of this paper is about what Facebook story is for that, although other people had other plans. Um, this um, arrangement's also potentially a bit fragile. Um, it allows you to scale up to far more users than you could have gone with databases alone because memcache is so fast. But what that means is that you're going to end up with a system that's sustaining a load that's far, far higher, you know, orders of magnitude higher than what the database is could handle. And thus, if anything goes wrong, for example, if one of your memcache servers were to fail, um, and meaning that the front ends would now have to contact the database because they didn't hit, they, they couldn't use this to store data, you're going to be increasing the load on the databases dramatically, right? Because memcached, you know, supposing it has a, you know, hit rate of 99% or whatever it happens to be, um, you know, memcache is going to be absorbing almost all the reads. The database back end is only going to be seeing a few percent of the total reads. So any failure here um, is going to increase that few percent of the reads to maybe, you know, I don't know, 50% of the reads or whatever, um, which is a huge, huge order of magnitude increase. So um, as Facebook does, once you've got to rely on this caching layer, you need to be um, set up pretty uh, serious measures to make sure that you never expose um, the database layer to the full, uh, anything like the full um, load that the caching layer is seeing. And you know, you see in Facebook, they have um, quite a bit of thought put into um, making sure the databases don't ever see anything like the full load. Okay. Um, so, so far, this is generic. Um, uh, now I want to sort of switch to a big picture of um, what Facebook describes in the paper for, uh, for their overall architecture. Um, of course, they have lots of users. Every user has a friend list and status and posts and likes and photos. Um, but, but Facebook's very sort of oriented towards showing data to users. And um, a super important aspect of that is that Fresh data is not absolutely necessary in that circumstance. You know, suppose um, the reads are, uh, you know, due to caching. Suppose the reads yield data that's a few seconds out of date. Um, so you're showing your users data, not the very latest data, but the data from a few seconds ago. You know what? The users are extremely unlikely to notice, except in special cases, right? If I'm looking at a news feed of today's, you know, today's news, you know, if I see the news from a few seconds ago versus the news from now, a big deal. 
nobody's going to notice, nobody's going to complain. You know, that's not always true for all data, but for a lot, a lot of the data they have, they have to deal with, um, sort of super up-to-date consistency in the sense of like linearizability um, is not actually important. Um, what is important is that you don't cache stale data indefinitely. You know, what they can't do is by mistake, have some data that they're showing users that's from yesterday um, or last week or even an hour ago. Those users really will start to, um, to notice that. So, so they, they don't care about um, consistency like second by second, but they care a lot about not, um, not, being in, in, not showing stale data from more than, well, more than a little while ago. Um, the other situation in which they need to provide consistency is if a user updates their own data, or if a user updates almost any data and then reads that same data that the human knows that they just updated. It's extremely confusing for the user to see stale data if they know they just changed it. Um, and so in that specific case, um, the Facebook design is also careful to uh, make sure that if a user changes data, that that user will see the change data. Um, okay, so Facebook uh, uh, has multiple data centers, which they call regions. Um, and I think at the time this paper was written, uh, they had two regions. Their sort of primary region um, was on the West Coast, California, and their sort of secondary region was um, in the East Coast. Um, and the two data centers uh, look pretty similar. Um, uh, each one of them had a set of database servers running MySQL. They're sharded data over these uh, MySQL database servers. Um, they had a bunch of memcached servers, which, which we'll see are actually arranged in independent clusters. And then and they had a bunch of front ends. Um, again, uh, sort of a separate arrangement in each data center. Uh, and there's a couple of reasons for this. Um, one is that their uh, customers were scattered all over the country. Um, and it's nice just for performance that people on the East Coast can talk to a nearby data center um, and people on the West Coast can also talk to a nearby data center. It just makes internet delays less. Um, um, now the, the, the Data centers were not symmetric. Um, each of them held a complete copy of all the data. And they didn't sort of shard the data across the data centers. So the West Coast, I think, was a primary. And it sort of had the real copy of the data. And the East Coast was a, a secondary. Um, and what that really means is that all writes had to be sent to the uh, um, relevant database in the primary database center. So you know, any write gets sent you know, here. And they use a feature of MySQL, a sort of asynchronous log replication scheme to have um, each database in the primary region um, send every update to the corresponding database in the secondary region so that with a lag of maybe even a few seconds, um, these database servers would have identical content. The secondary database servers would have identical content to the primaries. Um, reads, though, were local. So these front ends, when they need to find some data, um, in general, would talk to Memcache, Memcache in that data center. And if they missed in Memcache, they'd talk to the, they'd read from the database in that same data, uh, data center. Um, again, though, the databases are um, complete replicas, all the data on both of these data centers in both of these regions. All right, so that's the overall picture. Um, the next thing I want to talk about is a few details about how they um, how they use you know what this look aside caching actually looks like. Um, so uh, there's really there's reads and writes, and um, this is just what's shown in Figure Two um, for a read, which is executing on a, a front end. Um, the first thing, if you read any data that might be cached, the first thing that code in the front end does is uh, makes this get library call with the key of the data they want. And get just generates an RPC to the relevant memcache server. And so um, they hash, uh, this library routine hashes on the client, hashes the key to pick the 
memcache server and sends an RPTC to that memcache server. Memcache will either reply, yes, here's your data, or, um, or maybe it'll reply nil saying, I don't have that data. It's not cached. Um, so if, if V is nil, then um, the front end will issue whatever SQL query is required uh, to fetch the data from the, um, the database and then uh, make another RPC call um, to, mem to the relevant memcache server to install the fetch data in the memcache server. So this is just the routine I uh, talked through before. That's kind of what look aside caching does. And for a write, um, you know, V is the, you know, we're writing, we have a key and a value that we want to run a write, and this is a library routine on, on each front end. Um, we're going to send the, uh, the new data to the database. And, you know, I, as I mentioned before, the key and the value may be a little bit different. You know, what's stored in the database is often in a somewhat different form from what's stored in uh, memcache sheet, but we'll imagine for now that they're the same. Um, and once the database has the new data, then the write library routine sends an RPC to uh, memcache detailing it, look, you got to delete this key. Um, so I want to write, uh, the writer is invalidating the key in memcached. And you know, what that means is that the next uh, front end that tries to read that key from memcached um, is going to get nil back because it's no longer cached and will fetch the updated value from the database and install it into memcached. Um, all right, so this is an invalidate scheme. Um, in particular, it's not. You could imagine a scheme that would send the new data to memcached at this point, but it doesn't actually do that. Instead, it deletes it. And actually, in the context of Facebook scheme, the real reason why this delete is needed um, is so that uh, front ends will see their own rights. Because um, in fact, in their scheme, the memcache, the MySQL server, the database servers also send deletes. Whenever you any front end writes something in the database, the database with the McSqueal mechanism the paper mentions will send the relevant deletes to the memcache servers that, that might hold this key. So the data, the database servers will actually invalidate stuff in memcache by and by, it may take them a while. Um, but because that might take a while, uh, the front ends also delete the key so that the front end won't see um, uh, a stale value for data that it just updated. Okay. Um, okay, so that's all sort of uh, the background of, of uh, this, this is pretty much how everybody uses memcached. There's nothing yet really very special here. Um, now, eventually, you know, the paper is all about on the surface, all about solving consistency problems. Um, and it, indeed, those are important. Um, but the reason why they got, why they ran into those consistency problems is in large part um, because they, you know, modified the design or set up a design that had extremely high performance because they had extremely high load. Um, so they were desperate to get performance um, and kind of struggled along behind the performance improvements in order to, uh, uh, retain a reasonable level of consistency. And because the performance kind of came first for them, I'm actually gonna talk about um, their performance architecture uh, before talking about um, how they fix the um, consistency. Okay, sorry, there's been a bunch of questions here that, uh, that I haven't seen. Let me, let me take a peek. Okay, so, one question, this means that the replicated updates from the primary MySQL database to the secondary must also issue deletes to, um, yeah, so this is, I think, a reference to the previous sort of architecture slide. The observation is that, um, yes, indeed, when a front end sends a write to the database server, the database server updates its data on disk, um, and it will send an invalidate, a delete 
to whatever memcache server there is in the local region, the local data center that might have had the key that was just updated. The database server also sends um, a sort of representation of the update to the corresponding database server in the other region, which processes it and applies the right to its disk, uh, data on disk. It also, using the McSqueal sort of log reading apparatus, um, figures out which memcache server might hold the key that was just updated and sends a delete also um, to that memcache server so that uh, the, if the key is cached, it's invalidated in, in both data centers. Okay, so another question, what would happen if we delete first in the write and then send to the database? Um, so that's sort of with reference to this uh, thing here. What, did we, what if we did delete first? You know, um, if you do the delete first, then you're increasing the chances that some other client, so supposing you delete and then send um, to database, uh, right in here, if another client reads that same key, they're gonna miss at this point. They're gonna fetch the old um, data from the database and they're gonna then insert it into memcache and then you're gonna update it, leaving memcache for a while at least um, with stale data. And then if this, the writing client reads it again, it may see the stale data even though it just updated it. Um, doing the delete second, um, you know, that leaves open the possibility that somebody will read during this period of time and see stale data, but they're not worried about stale data in general. They're really most worried in this context about uh, clients reading their own rights. And so on balance, even though there's a, a consistency problem either way, um, doing the delete second um, ensures that clients will read their own rights. Um, in either case, eventually the database server, as I just mentioned, um, will send a delete for the written keys. Um, okay, another question I'm confused on how writing the new value shows stale data, but deleting doesn't. Um, um, let me see. Uh, um, I'm not really sure what the question is, is asking. The if it's with reference to um, this code, uh, once the write's done. Okay, maybe the question is: Supposing we didn't do delete at all, um, so that when a client, a front web front end, uh, did a wanted to update some data, it would just tell the database, um, but not explicitly delete the data from memcache. The problem with this. Um, is that um, if the client sent this write to the database and then immediately read the same data, that read would come out of the memcache. And because memcache still has the old data, you know, memcache hasn't seen this write yet, um, a client that updated some data and then read it, you know, updates the data in the database, but it reads the data, the stale data from memcache, and then a client might update some data but still see the old data. And if you delete it from memcache, then if a client, if, if you do do this delete, then a client that writes a, some data and deletes it from memcache and then reads it again, it'll miss in memcache because of the delete and it'll have to go to the database and read the data and the database will give it fresh data. Um, okay, so the, the question is, how come, um, why do we delete here? Gosh, why don't we just, um, instead of this delete, have the client just directly, since it knows the new, new data, um, just send a set RPC to memcached. And this uh, is a uh, this is a good question. Um, and so here we're doing, I have an invalidate scheme. This would often be um, called an update scheme. Um, and uh, let me try to cook up an example um, that shows that while this could probably be made to work, this update scheme, um, it, it, it doesn't work, um, it doesn't work out of the box and you, would, you need to do some careful design in order to make it work. So supposing client one, supposing now we have two clients, um, 
uh, reading and writing the same key um, interleaved. So um, let's say client one tells the database, um, you know, sends X plus plus to the database, right? just incrementing X. And then of course, or let, let, let me say, you know, it's gonna increment X from zero to one. So I'm gonna set X to one. And then uh, after that, uh, client one is going to um, call set of our key, which is X and the value one um, and write that at the memcached. Um, supposing meanwhile, client two also wants to increment X. So um, it's gonna read this latest value in the database. And almost certainly these are in fact um, transactions. So what if we were doing increment, what client one would be sending would be some sort of increment transaction in the database for cor correctness because the database does support transactions. Um, so we're gonna imagine that client two increments the value of X to two um, sends that increment to the database and client two also is, is gonna do this set. So it's gonna set X to be two. Um, but now what we're left with is uh, the value of one in memcached even though the correct values in the database is two. Um, which is to say, if we do this update with set, um, even though it, it does save us some time, right? Because now we're saving somebody a miss in the future because we directly set instead of delete. Um, we also run the risk if the, if it's popular data um, of leaving stale data in the database. Um, it's not that you couldn't get this to work somehow, um, but uh, it does require some careful thought um, to fix this problem. All right, so that was why they use uh, invalidate instead of update. Um, okay, so I was gonna talk about performance. Um, they uh, the sort of root of how they get performance is through parallel, parallelization, parallel execution. Um, and for a storage system, uh, just at a high level, there's really two ways that uh, you can get good performance. One is by uh, partition, um, which is sharding. That is, you take your data and you split it up over you know, into 10 pieces over 10 servers, and those 10 servers can run independently, hopefully. Um, the other way you can use extra hardware to get uh, higher performance is by replication. That is, have um, uh, more than one copy of the data. And you kind of, for a given amount of hardware, you can kind of choose uh, whether to partition your data or replicate it in order to use that hardware. Um, and uh, there's, um, you know, for memcached, what we're talking about here is, is um, splitting the data over the mem available memcached servers by hashing the key um, so that every key sort of lives on one memcached server. And for memcached, what we would be talking about here is um, having each front end just talk to a single memcached server and send all its requests there so that each memcached server um, serves only a subset of the front ends and sort of serves all their needs. Um, and Facebook actually uses a combination of both partition and replication. Um, for partition, the uh, things that are in its favor, one is that it's memory efficient um, because you only store a single copy of um, each item of data. Whereas in replication, you're gonna store every piece of data maybe on every server. Um, um, on the sort of downside of partition is that uh, it's, as long as your keys are sort of equally, roughly equally popular, works pretty well. But if there's some hot, a few hot keys, partition doesn't really help you much once you get those partition enough that those hot keys um, are on different servers. You know, once the, if there's a single hot key, for example, no amount of partitioning helps you because no matter how much you partition, that hot key is still um, sitting on just one server. Um, the other problem with partition is that um, it does mean that the front end, if front ends need to use lots of data, lots of different keys, it means in the end, each front end is probably gonna talk to uh, lots of partitions. And um, at least if you use protocols like TCP that keep state, 
uh, there's significant overhead to um, a, as you add more and more sort of n squared communication. Um, for replication, um, it's fantastic if if your problem is that um, a few keys are popular because now you know you're making replicas of those of those hot keys and you can serve each replica of the same key in parallel. Um, it's good because there's fewer, this, there's not um, n squared communication. Each front end maybe only talks to one memcache server. Um, but um, the bad thing is because it's, it, there's a copy of data in every server, you can cache far fewer distinct data items with replication um, than with partition. So there's less total data. Can be stored. So these are just generic sort of pros and cons of um, these two main ways of using extra hardware to get higher performance. Um, all right, so I want to talk a bit about their uh, what one sort of context in which they use partition and replication is at the level of um, different regions. Um, so I just want to talk through uh, why it is uh, that they decided to have um, separate regions and kind of com separate complete data center with all the data in each of the regions. Sorry, before I do that, there's a question. Why can't we cache the same amount of data with replication? Okay, so supposing you have um, 10 machines, each with a gigabyte of RAM, and you can use these 10 machines, each with a gigabyte of RAM for either replication or um, in a partitioning scheme. If you use a partitioning scheme where each server stores different data from the other servers, then you can store a total of 10 gigabytes of distinct data objects on your 10 servers, each with a gigabyte of RAM. So with partition, you know, each byte of RAM is used for different data. So you can look at the total amount of RAM you have. That's how much distinct data, you know, different data items you can store. With replication, um, you know, assuming your users are more or less looking at the same stuff, um, each, um, each replica, each cache replica will end up storing roughly the same stuff as all the other uh, caches. So you're 10, you have 10 gigabytes of RAM still that, um, on your 10 machines, but each of those machines stores roughly the same data. So what you end up with is 10 copies of the same gigabyte of items. Um, so in, that, in this particular example, if you use replication, you end up storing a tenth as many distinct data items. And you know th that may actually be a good idea, um, depending on you know, sort of what your data is like. Um, but it does mean that replication uh, gives you less total data that's cached. And you know you can see there's points in the paper where the, um, they mention this tension, um, and they. You know, they don't come down on one side or the other because they use both replication and sharding. Okay. Um, okay, so the highest level at which they're playing this game is between uh, regions. Um, and so at, the, at this high level, each region has a complete replica of all the data, right? Uh, they have a, each region has a complete set of database servers, each database, this database ser corresponding database servers store the same data. And assuming users are looking at more or less the same stuff, that means the memcache uh, servers in the different regions are also storing more or less, you know, basically replicating, what we have here is replicating in both the database servers and the memcache servers. Um, and the point again, one point is to, um, uh, you want a complete copy of the site that's close to West Coast users in the internet, locally in the internet, um, and, and another copy of the complete website that's close to users on the East Coast, close on the internet again. Um, and yeah, you know, the internet's pretty fast, but coast to coast um, is you know 50 milliseconds or something, which if you do, if users have to wait too many 50 millisecond intervals, they'll start to notice that amount of time. Um, Another reason is that the um, you want uh, a reason to replicate the data between the two regions is that these front ends to even cr create a single web page for a user uh, request 
often dozens or hundreds of distinct data items from the cache or the databases. Um, and so the speed, the latency, the delay at which a front end can fetch um, these hundreds of items from the, from the, from the memcache is quite important. And so it's extremely important to um, have the front end only talk to, only read um, local memcache servers and local databases so that it can do the hundreds of queries it needs to do for a web page very rapidly. So if we had partitioned the data between the two regions, then um, the front end, you know, if I'm looking at my friends and some of my friends are on the East Coast and some are on the West Coast, that means if we partitioned, that would, might require the front ends to actually make many um, uh, requests at you know, 50 milliseconds each uh, to the other data center. Um, and users would, uh, users would see this kind of latency um, and be very upset. So, so the reason to, another reason to replicate is to keep the front ends always close to the data, to all the data they need. Um, of course, this makes writes more expensive because now a front end in the secondary region needs to write and has to send the data all, all the way across the internet. Um, but reads are far, far more frequent than writes, so it's a good trade-off. Um, although the paper doesn't mention it, it's possible that another reason for complete replication between the two sites is so that if um, the primary site goes down, perhaps they could switch the whole operation to the secondary site. But I don't know if they had that in mind. Um, OK, so this is the story. Um, between regions is basically a story of replication uh, between the two data centers. All right, now within a data center, uh, within a region, So in each region, there's a single set of database servers. Um, so at, in, at the database level, uh, the data is sharded and not replicated inside each region. Um, however, at the memcache level, they actually use replication as well as sharding. So they have this notion of clusters. Um, so uh, a given region actually supports multiple clusters of um, front ends and database servers. So here I'm going to have two clusters in this region. This cluster has a you know a bunch of front ends and a bunch of memcache servers. And these are um, completely independent, almost completely independent. So that a front end in cluster one sends all its reads to the local memcache servers and misses it needs to go to the one set of database servers. And similarly, um, each front end in in this cluster um, talks only to memcache servers in the same cluster. Um, so why do they have this multiple clusters? Why not just have you know, essentially a single cluster, a single set of front end servers and a single set of memcache servers shared by all those front ends? Um, one is that if you did that, and, and that would mean, you know, if you, as you need to scale up capacity, you sort of be adding more and more memcache servers and front ends to the same cluster. Um, you don't get any win there for, in performance for popular keys. You know, so there, the data stored in these memcache servers is sort of a mix, you know, most of it is maybe only used by a small number of users, but there's some stuff there that lots and lots of users need to look at. And by using replication as well as um, sharding, they get you know, multiple copies of the very popular keys. Um, and th therefore, they get sort of parallel serving of those keys uh, between the different clusters. Um, another reason to not want to um, increase the size of the cluster, individual cluster too much is that all the data within a cluster is spread over um, partitioned over all the memcache servers. And any one front end is typically actually going to need data from uh, probably every single memcache server eventually. Um, and so this means you have a sort of n squared communication pattern between the front ends and the memcache servers. Um, and to the extent that they're using TCP for the communication, that involves a lot of overhead, a lot of sort of connection state for all the different TCPs. So they wanted to limit, so, you know, this is um, 
n squared TCPs. They want to limit the growth of this, and the way to do that is to make sure that no one cluster gets to be too big, so this um, n squared doesn't get too large. Um, and, and well, related to that is this in-cast congestion business they're talking about. The uh, if a front end needs data from lots of memcache servers, um, it's actually it's going to send out the requests more or less all at the same time. And that means this front end is going to get the responses from all the memcache servers that queried at more or less the same time. And that may mean dozens or hundreds of packets arriving here all at the same time, which, if you're not careful, will cause packet losses. Um, that's in cache congestion. Um, and in order to limit how bad that was, they had a bunch of techniques they talked about, but one of them was not making the clusters too large so that the number of memcaches a given front end to, to talk to and that might be contributing to this in-cast um, never got to be too large. Um, and a final reason the paper mentions is that it's sort of behind this is, is a big network in the data center. Um, and it's hard to, to build uh, networks that are both fast, like many bits per second, and can talk to lots and lots of different computers. Um, and by splitting the data center up into these clusters, and having most of the communication go on just within each cluster, that means they need a smaller, they need you know, a modest size fast network for this cluster and a modest size you know, reasonably fast network for this cluster, but they don't have to build a single network that can sort of handle all of the traffic um, between among all the computers of a giant cluster. Uh, so it limits how expensive the underlying network is. Um, on the other hand, of course, they're replicating the data in the two clusters. Um, and for items that aren't very popular and aren't really going to benefit from the performance win of having multiple copies, um, this, it's wasteful to sit on all this RAM. And you know we're talking about hundreds or thousands of servers here. So the amount of money they spend on RAM for the memcache servers is, is, is no joke. Um, so in addition to the um, pool of memcache servers inside each cluster, there's also this regional pool of memcache servers that's uh, shared by all the clusters in a region. And into this regional pool, um, they, they modify the software on the front end so that the software on the front end knows, aha, this key, um, the data for this key is actually not used that often. Instead of storing it on a memcache server in my own cluster, I'm going to store this not very popular key in the uh, um, appropriate memcache server of the uh, regional pool. So this is the, uh, the regional pool. And this is just sort of an admission that some data is not popular enough to want to have lots of replicas of it. They can save money by only caching a single copy. All right. Um, so that's how they get, that's this kind of parallel uh, replication versus partitioning strategy they use inside each, um, inside each region. Um, a difficulty they had that they discuss is that when they want to um, create a new cluster in a data center, they actually have a sort of temporary performance problem as they're getting that cluster going. So you know, supposing they uh, decide to install you know, a couple hundred machines to be a new cluster with a front end, new front ends, new memcache servers, and then they you know, fire it up and you know, maybe cause half the users to start using the new cluster um, and have to use the old cluster. Well, in the beginning, there's nothing in these memcache servers and all the front end servers are gonna miss on the memcache servers and um, have to go to the databases. And at least at the beginning, until these memcache servers get populated with all the sort of data that's used a lot, this is gonna increase the load on the database servers absolutely enormously. Um, because before we added the new clusters, maybe the database servers only saw 1% of the reads um, because maybe these memcache servers have a hit rate of say 99% for reads. But only 1% of all the reads go to the database servers before we added the new cluster. If we add a new cluster with nothing in the memcache servers and send half the traffic to it, it's going to get a 100% miss rate initially, right? Um, and so that'll mean, you know, we've gone from, and so the overall miss rate will now be 50%. So we've gone from um, 
these database servers serving 1% of the reads to them serving 50% of the reads. So in, at least in this imaginary example, we've increased by firing up this new cluster, we may increase the load on the databases by a factor of 50. Um, and chances are the database servers were running, you know, reasonably close to capacity and certainly not a factor of 50 or 50 under capacity. Um, and so this would be the absolute end of the world if they just fired up a new cluster like that. Um, and so instead, um, they have this cold start idea in which a new cluster is sort of marked by some flag somewhere as being in this um, uh, cold start state. And in that situation, um, when a front end in the new cluster misses, it actually first, um, it, if it, first it asks its own local memcache um, if that says, no, I don't have the data, then the front end will ask the corresponding memcache in another cluster, in some warm cluster that already has the data uh, for the data. If it's popular data, chances are it'll be cached. Um, the front end will get its data and then it uh, will install it in the local memcache. Um, and it's only if both the local memcache and the warm memcache don't have the data that this front end in the new cluster will uh, read from the database servers. Um, and so, so this, and so they run in this kind of cold mode for a little while. Um, the paper I think mentions a couple hours until the memcache servers sort of, and the new cluster start to have all the popular data, um, and then they can turn off this cold feature and just uh, use the local cluster memcache alone. All right. Um, so another. <laughs> Um, another load problem uh, that the paper talks about that they ran into, and this is a load problem, um, again, deriving from this kind of look aside uh, caching strategies, it's called a thundering herd. And uh, the, the scenario is that, you know, supposing we have you know, some piece of data, you know, there's lots of memcache servers, but there's some pieces of data stored on this memcache server. Um, there's a whole bunch of front ends that are ordinarily reading that one piece of very popular data. So they're all sending, constantly sending get requests for that data. The memcache server has it in the cache, it answers them, and you know their memcache servers can serve like millions, two million requests per second. So we're doing pretty good. Um, and of course, there's some database server sitting back here that has the real copy of that data, but we're not bothering it because the data is cached. Well, suppose some front end comes along and modifies this very popular data. So it's going to send a write to the database with the new data, and then it's going to send a delete um, to the memcache server because that's the way writes work. So now we've just deleted this extremely popular data. We have all these front ends constantly sending gets for that data. Um, they're all going to miss all at the same time. Um, they're all gonna now, having missed, send a read request to the front end database um, all at the same time. And so now this front end database is faced with maybe dozens or hundreds of simultaneous requests for this data. So the loads here is gonna be pretty high. And it's particularly disappointing because we know that all these requests are for the same key. So the database is going to do the same work over and over again to respond with the latest written copy of that key um, until uh, finally uh, the front ends get around to installing the new key in memcache and then people start hitting again. Um, and so this is the thundering hurt. What we'd really like is a single, you know, if a miss, if there's a write and a delete and a miss happens in memcache, we'd like what we'd like is the for, for the first front end that misses to fetch the data and install it, and for the other front ends to just like take a deep breath and wait until the new data is cached. Um, and that's just what their design does. If you look at the, uh, they have this thing called a lease, which is um, different from the leases we're used to, but they call it a lease. And uh, let me start from scratch in the scenario again. Let's see. Um, so now suppose we have a popular piece of data. Um, the first front end that asks for a data that's missing, um, memcached will, will send back an error saying, oh no, I don't have the data in my cache, but it'll install a lease 
um, which is a, a sort of big unique number, it'll, it'll pick a least number, install it in a table, and send this least token back to the front end. Um, and then other front ends that come in and ask for the same key, they'll simply get a, um, they'll just be asked to wait. Um, a quarter of a second or whatever, some reasonable amount of time by the memcache D because the memcache D will see, aha, I've already issued the lease for that key. You know, so there's a lease, potentially a lease per key. Uh, the server will notice it's already issued a lease for the key and tell these ones to wait. So only one of the um, servers gets a lease. This server then asks for the data from the database. Um, when it gets the response back, um, then it sends the put for the new data. Um, the key and the value it got and the lease to prove that it was the one who was allowed to write the data. Uh, Memcached will look up the lease and say, aha, yeah, you are the, uh, the person whose lease was granted and it'll actually do the install. By and by, these other front ends who are told to wait will reissue their reads. Uh, now the data will be there. And so we will, um, if all goes well, get just one request to the database instead of dozens or hundreds. Um, and I think that the sense in which it's a lease is that the front end fails um, at an awkward moment and doesn't actually request the data from the database or doesn't get around to installing it in memcached. Eventually, memcached will um, delete the lease because it times out, and the next front end to ask will get a new lease and will hope that it will talk to the database and install new data. So yes, the answer to the question, the, um, the lease does have a timeout in case the first front end fails. Yes, yes. Okay, so these leases are the, their solution to the um, thundering herd problem. Um, another problem they had is that if one of these memcache servers fails, um, the most natural, you know, what's, if they don't do anything special, if a memcache server fails, the front ends will send a request, they'll get back a timeout, the network will say, geez, that, you know, I couldn't contact that host, never got a response. Um, and what the read library software does is it then sends a request to the database. So if a memcache server fails and we don't do anything special, um, the database is now gonna be exposed directly to the reads, all these reads the memcache server was serving. And since the memcache server may well have been serving, you know, a million reads per second, um, that may mean that the database server would be uh, then exposed to those million reads per second, then it's nowhere near fast enough to, um, to uh, deal with all those reads. Now, Facebook, they don't really talk about it in the paper, but they do have automated machinery to replace um, a failed memcache server, but that takes a while um, to sort of set up a new server, a new memcache server, and redirect all the front ends to the new server instead of the old server. So in the meantime, they need a sort of temporary solution, um, and that's this gutter idea. Um, so let's see, the scoop is that um, we have our front ends. Um, we have this sort of ordinary set of memcache servers, um, the database. The, uh, one of the memcache servers has failed. We're kind of waiting until the automatic memcache server replacement system replaces this memcache server. Um, in the meantime, uh, front ends are sending requests to it. They get a sort of server did not respond error from the network. And then um, there's a uh, presumably small set of um, gutter servers whose only purpose in life is to, um, I, I, they must be idle except um, uh, when a, a real memcache server fails. And when a front end gets an error back saying that it, uh, get couldn't contact the memcache server, it'll send the same request to um, one of the gutter servers. And though the paper doesn't say, I imagine that the front end will again hash the key in order to choose which gutter server to talk to. Um, um, and if the gutter server has the value, that's great. Um, otherwise, the front end server will contact the database server to read the value um, and then install it in the memcache server in case somebody else answered, asked for the same data. Um, so while this main server is down, um, the gutter servers will uh, handle, basically handle its requests. And so there'll be a miss, you know, handled by lease, at least there's no thundering herd. There'll be a lease on each, you know, a miss on each of the items that was in the failed memcache server. 
Um, so there will be some load in the database server, but then hopefully quickly this memcache server will uh, get all the data that's, that's in use and um, uh, provide good service. And then by and by this will be replaced and then the front ends will know to talk to a different replacement server. And um, because they don't, and this is today's question, um, I think that they don't send deletes to these gutter servers because since a gutter server could have taken over for any one um, and maybe more than one uh, of the ordinary memcache servers, it could actually ha cache, be caching any key. Um, so that would mean that, and, and there may be, you know, front ends talking to it. Um, that would mean that whenever a front end needed to delete a key from memcache or when the McSqueal on the database uh, sends a delete for any key to the relevant memcache server, yeah, you know, the, the natural design would be that it would also send a copy of that delete to every one of the gutter servers. And the same for front ends that are deleting data, they would delete from the memcache servers, but they would also have to delete potentially from any uh, memcat uh, gutter server. And that would double the amount of deletes that had to be sent around, even though most of the time these gutter servers aren't doing anything and don't cache anything and it doesn't matter. And so in order to avoid all these extra deletes, um, they actually uh, fix the gutter servers so that they delete uh, keys very rapidly um, instead of hanging on to them until they're explicitly deleted. Um, that was the answer to the question. All right, so um, I want to talk a bit about consistency. Um, all this at a super high level, uh, you know, the um, the consistency problem is that there's lots of copies of the data. For any given piece of data, um, you know, there's a copy in the primary database, there's a copy in the corresponding database server of each of the secondary regions, um, there's a copy of that key in each local cluster, in one of the memcached keys in each local cluster. Um, there may be copies of that key in the gutter servers. Um, and there may be copies of the key in the memcache servers and the gutter memcache servers of each other region. So we have lots and lots of copies of every piece of data running around. When a write comes in, um, you know, the stuff has to happen on all those copies. And furthermore, the writes may come from multiple sources. The same key may be written at the same time by multiple front ends in this region, maybe by front ends in other regions too. Um, and so it's this concurrency and multiple copies and sort of multiple sources of rights, since there's multiple front ends, um, that creates a lot of opportunity for, um, not just for there to be stale data, but for data, stale data to be left in the system for long periods of time. Um, and so I wanna, I wanna illustrate, um, what are those problems? Actually, in a sense, we've already talked a bit about this when uh, somebody asked why the front ends don't update, why do they delete instead of updating? And so that's certainly one instance of the kind of, well, there's multiple sources of data, um, and so we have trouble enforcing correct order. Um, but here's um, another example of a, of a race, an update race that if they hadn't done something about it, would have left data indefinitely stale data indefinitely in memcache. Um, as, um, it's gonna be a similar flavor to the previous example. So supposing we have client one, it wants to read a key, um, but uh, memcache says um, it doesn't have the data, it's a miss. Um, so C1 is gonna read the data from, uh, from the database. And let's say it gets back uh, um, some value, value one. Meanwhile, client two wants to update this data. Um, so it sends, you know, it writes uh, key equals V2 and sends that to the database. Um, and then, you know, the rule for for writes, the code for writes that we saw is that the next thing we do is delete it from the database, to, from memcached. Uh, C2 is going to delete uh, the key from the database. And that's safe, right? You know, it was actually C2 doesn't really know what's in memcached, but deleting what's ever there is always safe because it's certainly not going to cause a 
um, stale data to be, deleting won't cause there to be stale data. Um, and this is the sense that they, paper claims that delete is item potent, so that delete, so it's always safe to delete. Um, but if you recall, the pseudocode for what a read does, um, if you miss and you read the data from the database, you're supposed to just insert that data into memcached. So client one, you know, may have been slow and finally gets around to sending a set RPC to uh, memcached, but it read version one, it read a, you know, what is now an old outdated version of the data from the database, but it's gonna set that into um, um, set this into memcache. And yeah, you know, one other thing that happened is that we know the database is, is whenever you, you write something in a database, it sends deletes to memcached. So of course, maybe at this point, the database will also have sent um, a delete uh, for K to memcached and so now we get two deletes, but it doesn't really matter, right? These deletes may already have happened by the time client one gets around to uh, updating this key. Um, and so at this point, um, indefinitely, a memcached will be caching a stale version of, of, of this data and there's just no mechanism anymore, um, or you know, the system, if the system worked in just this way, um, there's no mechanism for the memcached to ever see, to ever, um, get the actual correct value. It's gonna store and serve up stale data for key K forever. Um, and they, because they ran into this, and while they're okay with data being somewhat out of date, they're not okay with data being up out of date forever because users will eventually notice that they're seeing ancient data. Um, and so they had to solve this. They had to make sure that this scenario um, didn't happen. Um, they actually solved this, this problem also with the lease mechanism, uh, the same lease mechanism that we described for the thundering horde. Um, although there's a, an extension um, to the lease mechanism that makes this work. So um, what happens is that when memcached sends back a misindication saying the data wasn't in the cache, um, it's gonna grant the lease. So we get the misindication plus this lease, which is, um, basically just a big unique number. And the memcache server is gonna remember that the association between this lease and this key, it knows that there's somebody out there with a lease to update this key. The new rule is that when, the, when the, a memcache server gets a delete from either another client or from the database server, um, the memcache server is gonna, as well as deleting the item, is gonna invalidate this lease. So as soon as either of these deletes come in, assuming the deletes arrive first, the memcache server is gonna um, delete this lease from its table of valid leases. This set, um, it actually carries the lease back from the front end. Now when the set arrives, the uh, memcache server will look at the lease and say, wait a minute, uh, you don't have a lease for this key, or I invalidated the lease for this key, I'm gonna ignore this set. So because the lease has been, because one of these, if one of these deletes came in before the set, this lease would be invalidated, invalidated and the memcache server would ignore this set. Um, and that would mean that um, the key would no, just stay missing from memcache and the next client that tried to read that key would get a miss, would read the fresh data now from the database um, and would install it in memcache. And presumably the second time around, the uh, the second reader's lease would be valid. Um, you may, and indeed you should ask what happened if the order is different. So supposing these deletes, um, instead of happening before the set, uh, these deletes were instead to have um, to happen after the set. We wanna make sure this scheme still works then. Um, and so how things would, would play out then is that uh, since if these deletes were late, um, happened after the set, the memcache server wouldn't delete the lease from its table of leases. Uh, so the lease would still be there when the set came. And yes, indeed, we would still, then it would accept the set and we would be setting key to a stale value. But um, our assumption was this time that the deletes had been late and that means the deletes are yet to arrive. And when, they, when these deletes arrive, then the stale data um, will be knocked out of the cache. And so the stale data will be in the cache a little bit longer, but we, we won't have this situation uh, where stale data is sitting in the cache 
indefinitely and never deleted. Um, any questions about this uh, lease machinery? Okay. Um, uh, to wrap up, uh, you. Um, it's certainly fair to view this system, a lot of the complexity of this system as stemming from the fact that it was sort of put together out of pieces that um, didn't know about each other. Like it would be nice, for example, if Memcached knew about the database and understood that Memcached and the database kind of cooperated in a um, consistency scheme. Um, and uh, perhaps if uh, Facebook could have at the very beginning, you know, predicted the, uh, how things would play out and what the problems would be. And if they had had um, enough engineers to work on it, they could have from the beginning built a system that um, could provide both all the things they needed, high performance, multi data center, replication partition, everything. Um, and there have been uh, companies that have done that. So the example I know of that's sort of most directly comparable to um, uh, the system in this paper is that, that if you care about this stuff, you might uh, want to look at it, um, is Yahoo's Peanuts storage system, um, which in a sort of design from scratch and you know, different, different in many details, but it does provide uh, multi-site replication with consistency and um, good performance. So it's possible to do better, but you know, all the issues are, um, were present that just had a more integrated, uh, perhaps elegant set of solutions. Um, the takeaways though for us from this paper, um, one is that uh, for them at least, and for many big operations, caching is vital, absolutely vital for um, to survive high load. And the caching is not so much about reducing latency, um, it's much more about hiding the enormous load from relatively slow uh, storage servers. That's what the caching is really doing for Facebook is hiding, sort of concealing almost all the load from the database servers. Um, another uh, takeaway is that uh, you always, um, in big systems, you always need to be thinking about uh, caching versus control versus, sorry, partition versus replication. Um, and you need ways of uh, either formally or informally um, sort of deciding how much of your resources are going to be devoted to partitioning and how much to, uh, to replication. Um, and finally, um, ideally, you'd, you'd be able to do a better job in this paper about um, from the beginning integrating the different storage layers in order to achieve uh, good consistency. Okay, that is all I have to say. Um, please ask me questions if you have them.